Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the humanities program. I'm also the director of the Humanities Forum, which is a regular Friday afternoon series during the academic year in which we invite guests from on and off campus to consider some of the deepest human things. One of the things we really enjoy doing is hosting keynote addresses at certain points during the academic year, and today is one of those days. So let me extend a special welcome to all of you who are visiting from off campus for the Veritas Conference. I hope you have a wonderful couple days. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful uh, things planned. And now let me welcome to the podium my colleague Stephen Long, member of the theology department here and part of the humanities program planning committee. Welcome to the second annual Veritas Conference at Providence College. It's my pleasure this afternoon to say just a little about the conference, to introduce this year's themes, and to welcome our first keynote speaker. Living wisely in reality requires us to grasp reality as it is. As ethicist Oliver O'Donovan reminds his readers, we have to reckon, quote, not only with the fact that there is a world, but with what the world is like, where it has come from, where it is going, and how it holds together. These are not questions that answer themselves. Much moral thought turns on how the various elements that constitute the world are properly conceived and described. Is human nature a playground of selfish genes or the lord of creation? Is the human embryo a child or a mere piece of tissue? Is our behavior conditioned or is it chosen? Such descriptive questions are the stuff of moral debate. They determine all our practical attitudes." End quote. This observation can be taken as the fundamental justification for having an annual Veritas conference here at PC. We aim to address topics, to invite speakers, and to foster conversations that will aid students academics, and all those in our region, especially those who profess to be Christian, in describing and understanding our contemporary world. That is, understanding where it has come from, where it is going, how it holds together, and especially relevant for a Christian institution, understanding what hope is offered to it. This year's themes, hope and Christian friendship, were suggested in the course of last year's conference. Last year, speakers explored how the supposedly sovereign individual in modern America currently finds him or herself trapped between the demands of increasingly arbitrary self-definition and the simultaneous dissolution of the mediating institutions such as family, fraternal organizations, and churches that once conferred identity upon us. Personal identity is now focused primarily on one's inner psychological life independent of biology or socially given responsibilities. We seem to be both inherently aimless and yet required to determine our own aims. As sovereign individuals we are, we might say, alone in our sovereign self-determination, but required to pretend that we are not lonely. Nevertheless, lonely is just what many in our colleges and in our society and even in our churches, uh, loneliness uh, is what many in our colleges and in our society and even in our churches do experience the world to be lonely. The Christian church and the institutions, patterns of life and traditions of thought nourished by it has something profound to say precisely here. The Christian gospel announces that we do have something definite to hope for, ultimately the coming of the Son of Man and that this is a good that will be enjoyed in the fellowship of others. Or again, Christian hope is friendship, friendship with God, and friendship with each other in and through God. But of course, this insight prompts renewed rounds of trying to describe and to understand contemporary reality and the hope that we can speak to it. Just so, how might the natural love of friendship provide an intimation of ultimate beatitude? What has become of friendship in the modern world? How is friendship reordered within a Christian frame of reference? How is it healed and elevated, transformed by grace? 
Questions such as these, prompting description of reality, as well as prescriptive recommendations about how to live wisely in it, are the substance of our weekend together. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Francis Meyer as our first keynote speaker for the weekend. Fran is a senior uh, fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. His work focuses on the intersection of Christian faith, culture, and public life with special attention to lay formation and action. He served as senior advisor and special assistant to Archbishop Charles Chaput for 23 years in Denver and Philadelphia. And uh, here I might add that it was uh, the good Archbishop Emeritus himself who specially recommended that we reach out to Fran uh, and see whether he could join us for this weekend, uh, a suggestion that we were truly delighted to follow. Uh, and Fran previously served as editor-in-chief of the National Catholic Register and as a story analyst and screenwriter in Los Angeles. I'm looking forward to asking him more about that. He's a former fellow of the American Film Institute's Conservatory for Advanced Film Studies, a co-founding board member of the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture, and a board member of the Napa Institute. His written work has appeared in a wide range of venues, but I've been enjoying it most recently on the website of the journal First Things, where he's a frequent contributor. Please join me in welcoming Francis Meyer to Providence College. How's that? Can you hear me? Everybody in the back? Okay. A couple of uh, preamble remarks. Uh, first of all, you know, in a talk like this, you have a whole bunch of prepared remarks, and they're very important because they're the kind of the canonical aspect of this whole thing. But the really interesting part of these talks is what happens after it in terms of the discussion, the questions and answers. So I hope we have a good opportunity to really have some vigorous conversation after this. Second item is, if you go to YouTube tonight and type in the words Quentin Tarantino and uh, Switchblade Sisters, you will find Quentin Tarantino reading enthusiastically in about 12 videos from the script of Switchblade Sisters, which was a, a B-movie back in the 70s that he fell in love with, helped form his view of the world. And he loved it so much that he actually bought the movie and re-released it with a lot of fanfare in the 1990s. Now, one of the interesting things about Switchblade Sisters, it's truly one of the stupidest films ever made. And I wrote it. <laughs> so uh, don't hold that against me if you hear echoes of it in this talk. Uh, you know, when I, when I uh, began thinking about this, you know, Stephen asked me, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, what we need to talk about is what we need now, what we need now for renewal of uh, Jesus Christ in our personal life in the life of the church and in the life of the nation. Sounds pretty good, right? Except when I sat down, there was a kind of a divided highway that opened up. One of them was, all you need is love, and the other one was, all you need is a really stiff drink. And since I've been watching a lot of CNN and Fox News lately, I went with option B. <laughs> so with that said, let's get serious. <clears throat> I have to be my serious person now. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Long for including me in this conference. It's a special pleasure because I've known Ken Myers, Carl Truman, and Rusty Reno as friends for years. They're all exceptional men, and each of them is a superb scholar and speaker. So again, kudos to Dr. Long uh, for creating such a strong agenda this weekend. Since I'm the warm-up act for our gathering, I'd like to set the stage by talking about what we need now. What we need now as Christians, what we need now to renew the presence of Jesus Christ in our personal lives, in our church, and in our culture. A conference with the name Veritas in its title should be about truth-telling, and I'll try to provide a little of that. Truth matters, because somebody famous once said that the truth will make us free, not necessarily comfortable or happy, but free free to change our thinking, our actions, and our lives, free to become the men and women God made us to be, free to be better than we are. So I'll begin with a story that I've shared before, but it seems especially relevant to our gathering today. 
I served on diocesan staffs, uh, staffs for 27 years, including 23 as the senior aide to a bishop. And there was a morning some years ago when uh, I found a little gift from a friend on my desk when I got to the office. It's a wooden plaque about seven inches wide, and on it, burned into the wood with a branding iron, are the words, it is as bad as you think, and they are out to get you. <laughs> the friend who gave it to me is a Capuchin Franciscan by the name of Charles Chapu, who also happened to be my boss, and the Archbishop first of Denver and then of Philadelphia. And the gift tells you two things about the man. Number one, he has a healthy sense of humor. Number two, he's a stone cold realist. He's a realist because when you hear more than 15,000 personal confessions over the course of your priesthood, you get a pretty good sense of the human predicament. Our genius at screwing things up and God's fidelity in forgiving us and helping us to try again. You know, we're each a mixture of clay and spirit, carbon and grace, which means that realism, Christian realism, is a cocktail of skepticism and hope. Skepticism because unless we're really good at lying to ourselves, we all do know our sins. We each have a secret laboratory in our hearts where we perfect the flavor of our resentments and the elegance of our alibis. But hope is also part of the cocktail because despite our weaknesses, we're each capable of courage, charity, and mercy. And scripture testifies again and again to the fact that God never abandons his people because he loves us. This is why the great French Catholic writer Georges Bernanos described the virtue of hope as despair overcome. And it's why Augustine of Hippo should be the patron saint of our age. Augustine was never an optimist, but always a man of hope. He lived at the end of a world, a Roman world unraveling into confusion and not so different from our own. But in the face of all the fear and violence of his time, he wrote two books, his Confessions and the City of God, that still after 1600 years rank among the greatest works of human genius. He could do that because he had hope. He had hope because he had faith. And he had faith because he encountered God as a vivid personal experience in his life, the source of his joy and the source of his confidence. And he never let the distractions and the anxieties of his world dim that experience. We need to remember Augustine and his world because a healthy memory of the past grounds us in our identity as a believing people. The past explains the present and helps guide us toward the future. History never repeats itself. But the patterns of human thought and action that make history repeat themselves all the time. And we need to learn from them. Augustine lived in apocalyptic times, and so do we. But the word apocalypse is very easily misunderstood. It comes from the Greek verb apocalyptine, which means to uncover things concealed. An apocalypse may or may not involve suffering, but it always involves revealing certain truths about ourselves and our times. So for the rest of these brief remarks, I want to focus on two things. First, I'll try to explain where we are now as a church and a nation and how we got here. And second, I'll share some thoughts on what we need to do about it, both we as individuals and we as a community of faith. So let's turn to the first item, where we are and how we got here. I think most of us can sense that the church in this country now operates in a very difficult environment. Government is increasingly unfriendly. Much of the media establishment is hostile. The clergy abuse scandal hurt a lot of good people and damaged church credibility. Catholic sexual morality, which both reflects and undergirds the whole biblical understanding 
of who and what it means to be human is often seen as a form of bigotry. The effect is predictable. Baptisms, sacramental marriages, and church attendance are generally down. As many in one in three priests nominated for the episcopate now refuse the ministry because of the burdens that come with the job. A recent CNN story claimed that the decline of American Christianity is heavily overstated because so many Christians emigrate here from other parts of the world. But all such news is misleading. It's how immigrants integrate once they get here that matters. And it's a, pardon me, this is a big word, statistical. Uh, and it's a statistical fact that immigrant religious practice erodes sharply after the first or second generation. The Catholic Church has bled out especially among Latinos. And this was the group that held the most promise for a Catholic future. In practice, American life has become a master class formation in agnostic materialism. And yet, I mean, how could that be? America has deep Christian roots in the early Puritan experience. I grew up in a Catholic family with a strong love of the church and a strong love of country in equal measure. My eldest son attended West Point. It was a source of enormous pride for my wife and myself. Our closest friends for the past 50 years have been and still are a family of Marine Corps officers. So what happened to the country I once knew? A country where civic duty and religious faith seem to naturally coexist and reinforce each other. Excuse me one second while I take a drink of water. <laughs> A country where civic duty and religious faith seem to naturally coexist and reinforce each other. For me, the most important ideas about the Catholic role in the American experiment have come from John Courtney Murray, regrettably not a Dominican, but a good priest nonetheless. Father Murray was a key player in the 20th century development of positive Catholic attitudes toward religious freedom and American democracy. He saw clearly that the United States is the product of Protestant and Enlightenment thought. But he believed that Catholics could not only fit in to American life, but also thrive here by contributing their faith to the moral health of the country. And that's been proven true, at least in part. We Catholics have done very well in America, arguably too well for our own good. Today, Murray is probably best remembered for his work on Vatican II's decree on religious liberty and for his book, We Hold These Truths, a book very favorable toward America and its possibilities. But there's another side to Murray that I've always seen as an interesting footnote to his book. In 1940, he delivered a series of lectures that later became an essay entitled The Construction of a Christian Culture. And in it, he said the following about the country he loved. And I'm quoting directly. American culture, as it exists, is actually the quintessence of all that is decadent in the culture of the Western Christian world. It would seem to be erected on the triple denial that has corrupted Christian culture at its roots. The denial of metaphysical reality, the denial of the primacy of the spiritual over the material, and the denial of the social over the individual. Its most striking characteristic is its profound materialism. It has given its citizens everything to live for and nothing to die for. And its achievement may be summed up thus. It has gained a continent and lost its soul. Elsewhere in the same text, he says, and again I'm quoting directly, in view of the fact that American culture is built on the negation of all that Christianity stands for, it would seem that our first step toward the construction of a Christian culture should be the destruction of the existing one. In the presence of a Frankenstein, one does not reach for baptismal water, but for a bludgeon. Now, Murray wrote those words more than 80 years ago, 
His sympathy for the American experiment was very real, but it hinged on our nation preserving its biblical leaven and Catholics staying faithful to their religious identity. Neither has happened, just the opposite. In the last eight decades, we've seen the splitting of the atom, the sexual revolution, the marginalization of religion and public life, the rise of the administrative state, massive developments in science and technology, including, including the Human Genome Project, hypersmart AI, and invasive surve surveillance tools, and the transition of the United States from a continental republic to a de facto commercial and cultural empire with global influence. The America of 2023 would be unrecognizable to the John Courtney Murray of 1940 or even 1960. And the rate of scientific and technological change is accelerating. This has disruptive effect on the stability of the culture and on the psychological health of individuals. And this, in turn, results in our pervasive atmosphere of confusion and conflict. You know, some years ago, I was getting ready for a, uh, a, my a confession, and I uh, asked my wife what she thought my main problem was. <laughs> Guys in the audience, don't do this at home, <laughs> because wives have the annoying habit of telling you the truth. Uh, and, you know, I made some uh, suggestions. Well, you know, vanity, you know, impatience. Those are the easy things. Now, she laughed in my face and said, your problem is anger. And you know, I thought about it, and it's really true. I have a great life with a beautiful wife, uh, 11 grandkids, four kids. My life's been filled with wonderful blessings, and I've had a great career. And yet, I find myself angry much of the time. In fact, most of the people I know are angry about something most of the time. It's in the air we all breathe. And this translates into the frictions, the vindictive politics, and the crackpot destructive thinking that characterize so much of our current public life. My point is that we're living through a sea change unlike anything in the last 500 years. It has different names and explanations, the Great Reset, the New Reformation, the Great Awakening, the Upheaval, but the same transformational contact, content at society's cellular level. And old answers don't work. Old thinking doesn't work. I don't mean that we should abandon political engagement. We can't just move to another solar system and start over. As Christians, we have an obligation to do whatever we can to make the world better, here and now, as we find it. So I suppose what I mean is this. Many of us, I think probably most Americans, believe that we live in a familiar country with a familiar history, familiar rules, a familiar division of power, and a familiar personal role in governance through the ballot box. That country is draining away and retrieving the best of the America we once lived in, and again, as a Christian, I have to believe that's possible, won't be achieved with the standard, standard civic pieties, ecclesial attitudes, and framework of thought that I grew up with. Some of what is now advanced as good for America is very bad for the church and toxic for a life of faith. And that means we need to ask ourselves the kind of questions that force us to examine our premises, our strategies, and our tactics. And I worry that many of us who consider ourselves faithful Catholics haven't done enough of that which is why today's woke revolution often feels like an ambush when it's actually been a long march through the institutions. More of the same didn't work in Vietnam, and it's a lesson we should keep in mind in dealing with the struggles we now face as religious believers in a friendly, unfriendly culture. Okay, so having said all that, what do we do about it? What can we do about it as individuals, as a church, and a civil society. I said earlier that a healthy memory of the past grounds us in our identity as a believing people. This college and this city are named Providence after the protective care of God. Before we give ourselves over to freak out mode or despair, we need to remember our history. The church has been through radical shifts in society many times before, and yet, here we all are today. 
which means that the church is actually very, very good at playing the long game. But to do that, she does need her people to be alert and committed in their discipleship. And today our discipleship starts by recognizing that a lot of American life is now a narcotic haze of consumer distractions, disinformation, noise, and entertainment. What each of us needs most urgently is silence, a space for thought, self-examination, prayer, and listening for the will of God. I said a moment ago that I'm angry much of the time. Sometimes anger in the face of wickedness is righteous and ne necessary. Jesus himself showed his anger more than once in the Gospels. But anger is also one of the seven deadly sins because it so easily becomes a habit. It's delicious and toxic at the same time. It feels really good to nurse your imaginary vengeance on the liars, thieves, traitors, and frauds that inhabit, inhabit your head. But over time, that habit poisons everything beautiful in life. Anger is an acid that eats away every molecule of a person's joy. So how do we, hang, how do we handle anger? Well, how do I ha and handle anger, aside from not very well? Uh, you know, some years ago, a Protestant friend, a really good Christian man, asked me if I read the word of God. The question annoyed me. Remember, I have a problem with anger. <laughs> because I've been using scripture in my work for the past 45 years. But he wasn't asking me if I used the New Testament. He was asking if I listened to it speak. So I started reading three chapters of the Gospels every day. And, you know, the epistles, obviously, as well. Systematically, from the first verse in Matthew to the last verse in Revelation. And then adding, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of private prayer. And then doing it again and again and again. It hasn't been a trip to Lourdes, but it certainly fed my sanity, settled my heart, and now it anchors my day. So here's the point. Everyone in this room lives a busy life. Not everyone can do what I just described. But we all do need space for silence and contemplation in our personal lives because it keeps us human. It's where we encounter Jesus Christ outside of the Mass itself. As Augustine learned, the personal presence of Jesus Christ in our lives is the foundation of a strong faith. And the crisis of Christianity in our time is not a lack of of resources or leadership, although those things can be important. It's a crisis of faith. Too many of us don't really believe what we claim to believe. Our Christianity boils down to a kind of positive guide to ethical behavior. But it's not a conformity of our lives to the radical fact that Jesus Christ was murdered, turned into a corpse, but then rose bodily from the grave which is a fact that changes everything about humanity's dignity and purpose. It's the most central event in human history. One other thing about what we need as individuals, we need to stop defeating ourselves. Everything about the size and complexity of modern life is designed to create our dependency, to imply that we're powerless, that we need experts and therapists and paternalistic officials to tell us what to do. It's all nonsense. None of us is powerless. God made us for grandeur, not slavery. The power of those who seem powerless, in other words, our power, is a willingness to speak the truth and say no to a lie. It's a lie to claim that men and women can be men can become women and women can become men. It's a lie to claim that a child in the womb is not a real human person. And the word no, as an expression of the truth, throws sand in the machinery of deceit. Machinery which is only powerful to the degree persons submit their brains and their wills to it. As for what we need now in the church, you know, I'm often confused or troubled, but never really worried about the current state of the church. Mainly because the church is ecclesia sua, 
his church, the bride of Jesus Christ. The church belongs to him, not to us. The church is our church only in the sense of her being our moderate magistra, our mother and teacher. We don't own her. We can't reshape her according to the spirit of the times. And we have obligations to the believers who came before us and those who will come after us to protect the integrity of her teachings. I wish we had better preaching. I wish we had more beauty in the design of our churches and the celebration of our liturgies. I wish we had less discord in the church, although candidly it's always been this way because matters of doctrine and practice invariably circle back to what does and does not lead to salvation. I wish there were fewer Jesuits in the Pope's circle of collaborators. I think the Jesuit style governance is a poor model for the, wild, for the wider church. I personally think a synod on synodality is unwise. I think Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich as the synod's relator general is a very bad choice. I think that any compromise of Catholic sexual morality in the name of inclusivity would be a very serious error. I wish bishops were closer to their people. I wish we lay people knew our faith better. I wish we conformed our lives to the gospel more seriously. But of course, these are all just personal opinions, opinions that along with $5 will get me a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I do believe that we need to focus our resources, our prayers, and our personal involvement on two things in particular. First, in spite of what appears to be so negative, the church in the United States is actually loaded with signs of life that accomplish great work, but they get no attention in the secular media. I could name, I could name three dozen. I've done this in a speech, and, and People have fallen asleep, but I'm only going to, I'm only going to, you know, I'm thinking of the Augustine Institute, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, focus, right? Uh, the Leonine Forum, the Catholic Leadership Institute, and literally dozens of other ministries. Wherever we meet a healthy religious community or a fruitful lay apostolate, that's where we need to put our support and attention because they're the seeds of authentic renewal. You know, when you, when you hear good news, your spirit rises. And if we're focused all the time on the negative, it fails. So we need to remember that there's a lot of good going on in the church, a lot of life that never gets paid attention to. And second, we can never forget that the church is finally a people, a community of believers. In other words, she's more than just a collection of individuals, each with a private highway to God. The Catholic faith is first and foremost a communal experience. It's ultimately a form of friendship. That's what Jesus called his apostles in the Gospel of John and what he calls us, each of us, his friends. The parish is the cornerstone of that Catholic Christian life of friendship. The family is referred to as a school of love precisely because we don't get to choose our siblings. The parish is meant to work in the same way. But of course, it needs our investment of time and effort and humility before it can give anything back. And that leads us finally to just a few quick comments on what we need for the renewal of our culture and nation. The American founders had a special interest in Roman architecture, law, and the division of powers in the old Roman Republic. And that took shape in their creation of a federal republic with a system of checks and balances. We're not and never have been a direct democracy. And that's part of the successful design, just as it was in Rome. The Roman Republic worked well for a long time, but nations age and change just like people. When Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC, the Republic was already essentially dead, replaced by Roman imperial ambitions and the wealth that accrued to its ruling class. Our own country may lack a river named Rubicon, but it's a fact today that in the United States, 70% of the nation's wealth is in the hands of the top 10% of the population. The bottom 50% of the population, in other words, our plebeian class, have 2.5% of the wealth. And the gulf that separates our very rich from everyone else is actually widening. Wealth inequality 
in the United States is actually growing faster than in any other advanced economy. I don't need to add that public safety and the respect for law in some of our major cities seem to be un under extraordinary pressure. And civil discourse at many public events, not so different from this one, has disappeared. When you read modern experts on the Roman Republic like Edward Watts and Tom Holland, the differences between us now and the Romans then become very obvious. But so do the similarities, and they're striking. So how do we fix things? How do we restore what we once had? Well, the truth is maybe we can't. Maybe that shouldn't be our main focus. There's no quick fix for problems we behave ourselves into. But as Christians, we can at least change our thinking and our actions. We can support each other as friends, to save the good that can be saved, and to build something new and better over time. We can be the kind of leaven in our culture that the gospel calls us to be. In the city of God, Augustine is ferocious in his criticism of Roman iniquities. He never anchored his hope in earthly permanence or promises. But, he never stopped that, but that never stopped him from working with Roman authorities to serve the needs of his people. Politics involves the acquisition and the use of power, and power always has a moral dimension. So again, political engagement is actually a Christian duty. We have the obligation and the privilege to make this world as good as we can without ever deluding ourselves that it's our final home or that we, that, or that we can create heaven on earth. You know, when we create, try to create heaven on earth, we actually build a pretty good replica of hell. And the demonstration of that, the proof of that is you know, shown again and again in the last century. The great Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said that, I'm quoting here, only with gratitude can life become rich. He wrote those words in a letter from prison just months before he was hanged by the Third Reich. Gratitude is the antidote to fear and anger and the beginning of joy, no matter what our circumstances. And of course, that's at the very heart of Catholic Christian life. That's what the word Eucharist means. It comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. So it's a fitting word to close on because I'm thankful for your listening so patiently today. I'm thankful for the beauty of this campus. I'm thankful for the faith and friendship we share as Christians. And I'm especially thankful for God's gift of wine because after this I can safely have a glass. So, thank you. Okay. We have time for questions and conversation. So. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I had uh, kind of a technical question, but it, it may have some relevance on some kind of perspectives. Um, you mentioned that the word ecclesia is best understood as ecclesia sua. We are under Christ. Yeah, the church is best understood as, as ecclesia sua, yeah. Sure, so um, the word ecclesia is a technical term in the Greek city-state that refers to the assembly of free citizens. Mm -hmm. um, so who, uh, in the Greek city-state at least, who have votes or some kind of voice. So I wonder, so there's obviously the church is governed hierarchically by the bishops and um, the successor of Peter. There's obviously a top-down element. Um, so uh, is there a polarity, a polarity then, rather than just, you know, listening? I mean, you, you, you talked about, you talked about it in terms of top-down, but the word is actually a deliberative assembly consisting of the people in right, it. Right, but I'm using the word, uh, I, Ecclesia Sua is, is just b borrowed from Paul VI's uh, um, encyclical Ecclesiam Suam, okay? 
and the ch early church adopted ecclesia for the gathering of the faithful, but it's a very different kind of a gathering. And in terms of top-down, I'm not eliminating, in fact, I've said this in many other talks, I just didn't think it was fit fitting for today, you know, we're adults. Obedience does not mean servility. I mean, when we see something wrong, we have to say it. I, 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 the best example that I can give of that is life in the church is very similar to life in a, in a religious community or in a marriage. My wife has no trouble explaining to me with exquisite clarity what I'm doing wrong. And, and uh, that's just fair. That's how we should operate. But we have to be respectful of authority without just simply turning our brains off. I have another question, but I don't want to hog if, you know, I don't want to be that person who just... Okay, um, the, the early church for, for several centuries elected bishops. Um, and so, and the, so the, the jurisdiction of bishops was conditional on their election. Is there some, are there some reforms that could happen that include more of a top-down view well, in general? I mean, you know, uh, Augustine himself was kind of hijacked into being a bishop. He didn't want to be a priest, and he didn't want to be, he was a layman. You know, he just went to the wrong city at the wrong time and ended up a bishop. And, and, and so I'm, I suppose there are possibilities like that. The, pro the trouble with that today, and you see it in the German Synod, is that the, the, um, the world is so heavily penetrated by this kind of radical egalitarianism, which is not, in, that it's not churchly at all. That radical egalitarianism translates into a form of democracy that actually works against anything like the familial nature that the church should have. So uh, in theory, could they be elected again? You know, in theory, uh, synodality is a great idea. Its application is a very different reality. And, and uh, so I'm not gonna answer your question in an acceptable way, I guess, but I, anything is po almost anything is possible, but I would be really, really wary of democratizing the, the uh, the appointment of bishops at a time when we're all drunk on a very, I think, destructive form of democratic thought. I want to return to the um, topic of anger. Oh, good. Um, You've come to the right place, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that we, it's easy to learn from observing our culture is that people like to be angry, right? They like to be mad. They even like to hate people. In fact, they prefer to hate people in a way than to love people because it's easier. There's less commitment, right? Um, at the same time, and you sort of touched on this. I just wanted you to revisit it. We, anger or at least frustration or something else because that, that kind of anger that feeds our own joy and gets us a sense of self-righteousness and even group think, you know, we're, we're, we are the good people and those are the bad people. I mean, these are, these are parts of our sinful nature. Um, but at the same time, one has to be motivated, right? And one has to motivate others in order to, to stand against bad things. Uh, and this has always been the way it is. Uh, today, it's, as I said, it's more tricky because all we get is anger. All the things we encounter is one cycle of anger. The left is angry. Everything you read, you know, you can watch, you can watch some, uh, you know, news shows, uh, even ones you like, and by the end of it, you're, you know, you're, you're ready to go to war, you know. Uh, and that goes for both sides. And so I just wanted, you, you touched on it, and I just wanted you to give you a chance to say a little bit more because. I, lo I love talking about being angry. I, <laughs> I could tell. You seem like an expert. Yeah, look, so. I mean, the, the, Jesus got angry. I mean, you know, the, it's, it, I think it's really interesting. The guys that I read right now, people that I follow, I don't know if we talked about this at lunch or not, but I mean, there are people like Matthew Crawford and um, N.S. Lyons and, um, Paul King's North, uh, all who began as, as unbelievers and because of the anxiety and conflicts of the time have been has gradually driven them to be more and more famil uh, friendly to, to religious belief. Uh, their, one of their points though, and all, all three of them highlight this point that uh, 
there's, the, there's this tremendous sense of conflict in the air. And that shouldn't really surprise us. I mean, and in fact, in some ways, we have to embrace it. Embrace it. I mean, the whole idea of Christian knighthood, if you read uh, St. Bernard's uh, In Praise of the New Knighthood, was to create masculine men who would defend the church and defend pilgrims in, in the Holy Land. And they lived austere, ascetic lives. So there was a purity to it that was focused outward, not toward the destruction so much of the enemy, but the protection of the people who had to be protected. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about, defines Christianity as a fighting religion. You know, you can't avoid conflict. Of course, our tools are supposed to be courage and prudence and patience and mercy and, and fidelity and those things instead of you know, going and beating up the next guy. You can't escape conflict. Conflict breeds anger. Sometimes that anger is highly appropriate. But if you hang on to it, it becomes toxic, acidic. And we're tempted to do that. That's my primary temptation. You know, I mean, when I, I, I worked, when you work for a bishop for 23 years, you, you, you listen to a whole lot of crap, not from the bishop, but from the people who are criticizing him from both sides. And it just boils up in you, you know? And, and uh, it's, hard to, it's hard, to, uh, hard to control. I don't know how priests do what they do, for example. I mean, if you're listening to these confessions all day long, and then, then you're also being criticized because of the clergy abuse scandal, which you, most of these guys have nothing to do with. And that's just a really tedious way of living your life. I don't know if this is answering your question, but I mean, you, you, you can't avoid conflict. You have to embrace a certain amount of it because we have an obligation to protect the people in our care. And I don't make excuses for that, you know? But I have, I have to be very careful not to let it just take over the driver's seat in my life. And that is very, very easy, which means that you have to pray. You, know, you have to have a pri you have, have to have an inter interior life where you're constantly in dialogue with with God and and doing a self examination. I mean, religious do this routinely. Priests do this routinely, or they should anyway. Uh, lay people frequently just think that their religion is doing nice things in the world, and there's a, that's an important fact factor in our, our vocation. But we also need time to listen to God, to seek Him out. Thank you. There's a lot to commend your talk uh, with today. And uh, I'd like to ask a question which is on the minds of a lot of young people especially. It's potent in the minds of young people. The inequality of income. We talked a little, you talked a little bit about that. The young people are on a verge of choosing between capitalism, which they think doesn't work, obviously, or socialism which means concentration camps in China. And um, what's, do, do you look at this as a moral catastrophe? I didn't hear the end of that. Do, you, do you look at this as a moral capa a catastrophe? Mm -hmm. I, do I? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, but but I, I'm, I'm ambivalent about it. You know, the words like socialism, capitalism, Christianity, Islam, I mean, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Basically, what's happened among a, a generation of young people, I think, is just a disenchantment with um, inequality of wealth. And what's the option? You know, if you get tri if you got taught in an in a educational institution by a neo-Marxist, that's going to, you know, penetrate the way that you penetrate the way that you think. Um, I don't think they think systematically. Young people, most of them. I, I don't think that a lot of us think at all anymore because of Twitter and things like that. That just have broken down the logical structure of uh, political discourse. So I, I, I think I, this was coming through in some of my remarks. I don't have much hope for the immediate future. Long term, yes, indeed. But um, there's going to be a huge falling off from American values that you and I, people of our age, would have remembered, and also religious values, because uh, an en entire two or three generations has been catechized in a really aggressive way with values that are um, antithetical to what we believe. I don't think that's the end of the story, though. If I did, I'd you know, blow my brains out. I mean, the, the point is, is that Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that changes everything. But you know, the church 
uh, we're promised that the church is going to survive. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to survive here. And there have been historical circumstances where it hasn't survived. So we just have to do what we can. And, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of lieutenants <laughs> in the battle, not generals. I mean, God's in charge, and we just have to do the best that we can. That's a really unsatisfying answer, but I think it's the only one that matters. It's going to get worse. We just have to be, believe in God and, and do the best to, to save what we can. I th you know, I think one of the, um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, anger, something I suffer from as well and have confessed many times. We should start a union, actually. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But I, um, I think one of the things that makes people angry, certainly makes me angry, is that the, those in power don't get more angry. You know, they, they're in a position to do something about the injustices we see and they do nothing. You know, they just go along, they take the easy path, and, 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 I, and I recognize the danger of anger being, for myself anyways, that it can give you the illusion of having done something. You get really angry, you get that, that, that rush, that satisfaction, the feeling like, oh, I've done something, you've done nothing. Uh, and because often, because we're powerless, or because we're lazy, or because we don't want to lose the, our position, we do nothing. So I don't want to end with that comment. I want to ask you a question about the difference between hope and optimism. Because that's another thing I struggle with personally, and maybe others do too, is confusing the two. Because I fought many battles. I, I teach at Providence College. And I fought many battles here and lost most of them. And, and uh, have been accused of being Pollyannish. And uh, sometimes I'm told I confuse hope with optimism. And, uh, you seem to be somebody who knows uh, the difference, so I would be appreciated yeah, if you would say pessimist. something about it. Yeah, I, because sorry. what? <laughs> because I'm a pessimist. <laughs> you know. well, I think I need a little more of that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, optimism, this is, this is real crude, and you would recognize it as being crude immediately. I mean, hope is a virtue, optimism is an attitude. And, and uh, the, I, I just don't find optimis optimism as sustainable. I mean, if you look at the statistics of what young people actually believe right now, if you think electing the next president as a conservative Republican is going to fix things, you're out of your mind. It's just not going to happen because the, the game is already over in key institutions like the educational institutions, HR departments, and capitalism, you know, the, in, 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 pardon me, in, in uh, corporations. I mean, the, the game's over. We lost, okay? Get that, get that into your head, or I, I've gotten it into my head. But that's just a battle, a campaign. You know, it took 40 years for them to get to this point. It, it will take us 40 or 50 years to get back something that we recognize as reasonably human and Christian. Uh, so that's what we have to focus on, not what we lost. You know, and how we do that, well, we don't know because the, the battlefield is still a terrain that's largely unknown. In fact, a lot of people just don't even really want to believe that we're in a battle. I'm sure you've encountered that, you know. Uh, I'm not answering your question in the way that you, you need it answered, though. I mean, the, the I get, you know, I have a, a priest friend, a Monsignor, who uh, I once made the mistake of telling I'm Irish and German. And he said, that, let me tell you what that means, perfect guilt, you know. And, 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 and it's true. So, I mean, that's my fundamental attitude toward life. It will probably get worse. And if it doesn't, you know, um, hey, that's pretty good, cool. But that's, that's, that's an emotional attitude. Hope is a decision, for me anyway, a decision to say, you know, I actually believe, and that belief gives me hope for the future. Because if you look at the evidence of the past, it tends to prove that the church is really good at the long game. Doesn't mean I'll know about it because I'll be in the grave or such a, some such place, but I mean the, 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 the point is that the church is very, very good at surviving incredible pressures, but not tomorrow. It takes time, and we have to be part of the bloodstream that makes that change happen. That's hope. If you really want to, the best, the best uh, example of the difference between hope and um, optimism is some of the essays, the last essays of uh, Georges Bernanos. I forget the company that just re-released them. I have a copy of, from the 1950s. 
and it's wonderful. He is utterly sardonic. I mean, just sardonic to church leadership, uh, toward average believers. Uh, he has a wonderful essay. Uh, he has a wonderful essay that's basically uh, uh, a homily by an atheist to a church load of Catholics on the feast day of St. Therese. And he basically telling Catholics, you know why I don't believe it's because of you. <laughs> and and it, he's just, he's got a grasp of the kind of raw element of truth in Christianity that I find really revivifying. I have hope because I read guys like him. My friend, um, St. John Henry Newman at one point, I think in Grammar of Ascent, said it's not a crisis of faith, which I think, he said it's a crisis of the imagination. That too, absolutely. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, Thank no, you. that's a really good way of putting it, actually. But I think it's more than that. I mean, the, the lack of faith reduces the horizon of the imagination. You know, and we lack faith because we've been catechized in the materialism that basic and pragmatism, which is a great strength of the American personality. That's why we're so inventive. But um, I would, I would, I guess I would disagree with them. I think what we believe uh, charges and frames how we imagine the world. But it's still a good observation on his part. You know, we're a novus ordo seclorum. That's what we are. Isn't it printed on all our money? I think. You know, a new order of the ages. Talk about arrogance, you know? I mean, it's right there, right up front. And that's why we're so, long. Christopher Lash wrote a book, a number of books that included this. I mean, he made the point as a secular historian that Americans are lousy at history. We're lousy at history for a very good reason. We don't like it because the past is a burden on our ability to self-invent, reinvent ourselves, you know? But if Catholics can't think like that, Christians shouldn't be thinking like that because we're part of a story just like the Jewish people that uh, goes back thousands of years. And the Jews have stayed an, uh, an integral people by remembering who they are. And American culture is excellent at helping us forget who we are. And that's just a disaster for uh, you know, the, ma the, maintenance of, um, the maintenance of a unity of a people across the generations. Thank you for your lecture and for sharing your thoughts. I, I particularly enjoyed uh, your talking about uh, St. Augustine, making that one point of reference to, of course, him writing the city of God following the invasion of Rome and really um, not just trying to think about the consequences of that, but mourning the collapse of that world. Um, and then, you know, that's just one example in our history, as, as you well know, um, I mean, just less than 200 years later, Gregory the Great will still be uh, dealing with, in, you know, the same collapse of the city of Rome and the, and the ongoing invasions and all the problems there. And this will repeat itself throughout the history of the church and other situations and contexts. And in that sense, I think what we're going through today, not to, not to trivialize the experience at all, uh, because it is the experience that we're living through right now, um, and there is a lot of suffering that goes along with, with this. Um, but I, th I think if we could, I, I, especially here in the United States, as you've just finished saying, in fact, this anticipated my comment, we don't know history very well. We don't know our own history very well as Americans. Most Americans do not know American history very well. And as Catholics, the va I mean, most Catholics that I meet have very little understanding of, of church history and um, I mean, throw my cards out. I'm a historical theologian and church historian, but 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 the point is, um, you know, if you understand, as you said, the Ecclesia Sua, that this church is Christ's church, and that Christ has made this promise to be with us to to the end. If you if the more we help each other understand our our history as Catholics. And the fact that we're protagonists in our generation of this millennial long history, um, I think it helps, it, it can really help to get kind of help us orient ourselves and be open to the grace of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in this period of time. And I just wondered, um, my, this is really my question for you. Uh, do you have any, you know, from your experience and, and, and your work and, 
um, knowing that this really isn't the end of the story for the church, um, and also knowing, as you've eloquently said, that we can't just totally disengage and would treat because now the, the larger society around us is, is openly hostile or more hostile towards, towards us. Um, <clears throat> do you have, I mean, aside from a few of the examples you gave of maybe institutes that have been founded or leadership conferences, can you think of any other advice or for, that you would give us about like how we in this room can, can um, not just mourn the loss of a passing of another age or per perhaps even a possibility to evangelize in a more profound way our, our own country, but to, um, you know, how can we try to be open to the spirit to really help the church, you know, move through this period to be open to whatever the spirit is leading us to uh, in the future. Don't cheat on your spouse, quite literally. That's the, that's the place you begin if you're a married man, married woman. You know, I mean, I, I have, what do I control? You know, I say all this stuff, but I don't have any control over any of it, you know, other than the fact that I spent the time to try to learn some of it. I do have control over how I treat my wife and my kids and my grandkids, and that's what I'm gonna be held accountable for. And I think that's very powerful when people stop worrying about what they don't have control over and concentrate on doing well what they do have control over. That's a really good ink spot in human relations. I have an obligation to my grandchildren, to my children, um, and to my wife. If I do those things well, I get a B plus, okay? And then if I do other things, great. You know, if I can affect other people by what I say or the friendships that I develop, that's even better. And that's how Christianity spread. It was, a, it was an ink spot, you know, that gradually won people over little by little over a long period of time. I think it, um, I'm sorry, I'm 74 and my brain is starting to slide. But, but there's, there, uh, who's the French philosopher, French Catholic philosopher that um, won the, the uh, Benedict Award? Does anybody know? Pardon uh, me? Marion. Marion, Jean-Luc Marion? No, it's Marion's friend. Oh, um, what's his name? Uh, no, no, not, he's a political scientist. Yeah, uh, no, Ra anyway. Ra Ramy Brog? Exactly, okay, you get the, you get the award. Okay, Thank so you. Remy Brog, the irony is, is I know Remy Brog and I couldn't remember his name. The, 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 uh, uh, but, you know, Remy Brog made a really interesting point in one of his books where he, deli the, he said there are two political religions, Christianity and Islam. And he compared them. What did Islam do? Islam conquered the civil society and then changed the religious society. What did Christianity do? Christianity conquered the civil society, which then had political consequences. It's a fundamentally different way of living one's faith. You know? And, and the, the, the fact is, is that we win the culture war by, first of all, changing ourselves and the people around us that we have um, some influence over. And again, it's a very long guerrilla war. That's why I, I, say th I say this so often that people get tired of it, you know, but I mean, my favorite Chinese theologian is Mao Zedong. Now, Mao Zedong was a murdering monster. Uh, nobody's perfect, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he wrote an essay in 1938 called On Protracted Conflict. And what he said there was that, so I, I don't have it exactly in my head at the moment, but you know, weapons are an important factor in war, but they're not the decisive factor. The decisive factor are people because people deploy weapons. People, not things, are decisive. That's the key line in that entire essay. People, not things, are decisive. If we all go through a conversion where we take our faith seriously and just find intelligent ways to share it with the people around us, starting with our family, that wins in the long run. That wins, and we can do that. I can't, you know, pry Joe Biden out of his office, and I sure don't want Trump back, you know, but I'm not gonna have much control over that other than voting once. Some people vote a lot more than that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, and that's sort, of a, that's sort of a governor, a break on my emotional turmoil. You know, I got, I've gotten to a point where I literally cannot sit and watch Fox News. I like Fox. 
My wife has kicked me out of the living room more than once simply because I, I just start arguing with the television set. And, and I know other guys that do that. You know, I had, a, I had an Opus Dei press, uh, priest tell me once that two of the guys that he had been counseling died from heart attacks arguing with Obama on the television screen. Uh, you know, so, I don't know, guys. I mean, you're more powerful than you think, but not powerful in the political sense. You're powerful in the, in the pre-political sense of forming people. By the way, there's a great book, um, a great essay by Václav Havel, which some of you would surely know, The Power of the Powerless. I highly recommend it. But Havel is well known. He had a good friend, Václav Benda. And Václav Benda was a, a very serious Catholic. And he wrote a very uh, important essay called The, the um, Parallel Polis. And his argument was that in the, uh, in the Soviet bloc in the 80s, that um, there was no way of changing the political environment directly. You know? So what did he do? You had to build networks of friendships that, that paralleled the way that the government worked. So that when the government eventually fell, which it would do, that there were these networks of people who knew each other who could rise into positions of authority and change the nature of the culture. So that's something to read, that essay by Václav Benda. Um, he's really a very good Catholic, and uh, it's called Par the, the Parallel Polis. Um, thank you. Uh, th th there was one. I'm over here. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Sandra Keating. I'm in the theology department. Um, actually, I had raised my hand a while ago, and several people have already basically asked my question. So, but um, but I I was really struck by one of the things. I mean, many many things that you said. I think it sounds so true. My my problem is um, I often uh, just become extremely discouraged. Um, you know, I feel like I, I, the image I use is I'm, I'm clearing the beach with a teaspoon, you know, and, uh, and the tide keeps coming in, you know, and so you feel like everything you've done just... That sounds get, very Augustinian. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, so, uh, yesterday or a couple days ago in one of my classes, we were talking about something that it piqued my interest, and you were just saying that... Um, uh, we've kind of forgotten who we are, and um, uh, something I've noticed, I, I'm from the Midwest, uh, I grew up, you know, in the middle of nowhere with lots and lots of open space and silence and everything, um, and it, it's hard even to communicate to young people today, or for older people for that matter, um, the how detached we are from nature and creation and our inability to spend any time alone in silence, um, our fear of nature, um, you know, the fear, I mean, I'm always shocked by people's fear of animals, you know, and things, I mean, just, you know, things that I grew up with that I would never have thought of, insects, you know, all that kind of, I mean, that sounds a little trivial, but, but to me what it is is it shows a, a complete detachment from creation and and to me that was that was how I came to know that God was real um, and I see that that that's just a it's just an avenue that's closed off to so many people today um, that's not really a question but I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that because when you when you mentioned that the problem of not being able, not being able to find silence is I think just a, a tremendous problem today uh, in a technocratic society, nature is the enemy because it's uncontrolled. And everything about uh, the combination of the liberal order, liberal with a, you know, I guess a small l. I don't, I don't mean liberal politics. I mean the liberal order that we've li lived in for the last 200 years. Everything about the liberal order combined with um, uh, a, techni a technocratic mindset uh, is anti-nature because we don't control it. And the will in the environment that I just described must change the world in order to fit the will instead of the will submitting itself to the reality of nature and then finding a way to fit with it and be happy in it. Um, I, I think it's really one of the key things that's wrong with American society right now. And it's going in the wrong direction. You know, I've been video gaming for 40, 40 years. I'm real junky for it, mainly, mainly military stuff. But, but um, I'm also, I love virtual reality, you know, except it affects me in a very different way than it does my, kid, my grandchildren. Why? 
because I was formed in a typographic culture. A typographic culture, a print culture, teaches you to think sequentially with grammar and verbs and nouns to create a logical argument, no matter what your sentence is, you know? All that's out the window in, image, in an image-based culture. And that's exactly what VR and the whole techno technocratic regime is, is about. It's a different way of looking at the world and a different way of learning. And, and our political system, and the church for that matter, are not adapted to that, which is one of the reasons we are facing the problems that we are. I don't know if that, that's kind of off the topic, but, but I, you know, what I would recommend to everybody here, actually, because I'm addicted to these now, uh, and every, you, know, you want to share your addictions, but the, the, there, there are a number of thinkers, I may have mentioned this to a few of you, there are a number of thinkers that are really affecting me right now. Matthew B. Crawford, you know, the world outside your head. He has, a, he has a, a sub stack now that's very, very good. It's called Arcadelia. Another one is N.S. Lyons. Uh, he has a sub stack called The Upheaval. Fantastic stuff, just fantastic stuff. And the last one, which deals particularly with your point, Sandra, is uh, by uh, Paul Kingsnorth. He has a, a sub stack called Abbey of Misrule. And he wrote, an, he wrote an essay in First Things just a couple of months ago called, uh, it was something like Toward a Wild Christianity, which is just a fabulous thing. And the thing about all three of these guys is none of them was religious five years ago. Not one of them. And they're not really religious now, but they're all admitting that maybe they should be. I mean, Kings North just converted to Eastern Orthodox Christianity like two, three years ago. And, and uh, because why? Because there are metaphysical issues that the current liberal technocratic order does not recognize and cannot answer, but they're deep, deep in the human heart. And, and um, that's where the search for God begins, you know? I'm, I, I feel bad, I've got everything, but I feel lousy, there's something missing. If you deal with that honestly, it will lead you to God. And American culture right now, this is what I meant by agnostic, uh, the, uh, the catechesis of agnosticism. Everything in this culture is designed to distract you from, that, from those fundamental questions and to be an anesthetic so that you don't really worry about it so much. That's just, you know, really destructive. In fact, uh, uh, one of my favorite um, philosophers, Italian uh, Augusto del Noce, who's another pe per person that's worth reading, you know, described the United States as the most thoroughly thoroughly atheistic culture in human history. Not ideologically, but simply by the kind of culture that we've created. It removes the, heart, the desire and the need for God, or appears to, but it actually doesn't, which leads you to these kind of internal, constant internal conflicts that we deal with. Yeah, hello, it's me. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I have two questions so the, so I, I am I am South African but became American in 2000 2018 anyway so I, I'm saying this as someone who hasn't been in the country for that long um, so the first question is I guess I, I think I know how you're gonna answer this but I, I want to hear you think about it is the issue now like qualitatively different because sometimes it because I, I guess I feel like I can point back in time, each point in time in history and say, this is awful, <laughs> right? Um, and there was a lot of, let's say, catechizing in, in awful ways, right? Um, so I, I, yeah, so I want to hear you say something about that. Is it qualitatively different and in, in what way? I mean, sometimes you seem to be worrying about a loss of cultural power, but what you were just saying now made it seem like there's a creation of a, there's a creation of a, there's a new cultural something on the loose that's cre creating a kind of self that's incapable of, of Christian faith. Right. That's what I hear you saying on one. I, I, I'm not sure in, that that's exactly right, but I think I know where you're heading. I do oh, think that there is a qualitative difference between now and anything that's come in the past. Okay. 
Okay, because I, I just want to say, if it's the latter about this incapacity for faith because a new cell thing, I want to say if we can, if we allow to ever say that, you know? I'm sorry? I, I want to know if we allow to ever say that as Christians, that there's some kind of self that's being created that's like incapable of faith, you know? Well, you're never incapable of faith, but I think what's, what's unique about our time is that it's done the most effective job of preventing the questions that lead to faith. I do okay. think that. Okay, good. you're jumping ahead, but <laughs> so I, um, I want to hear you think, think out loud about that more, I guess. The second one has to do with um, scripture. So, you know, I, um, I was just uh, reading um, first Peter uh, recently with, with the church group. And like, what's infuriating about the New Testament sometimes? It's like, everyone's just like joyful all the time. You know, it's like, what's wrong with you guys? You know, there's like, you know, it doesn't look good if you're an early Christian, right? If you're just looking out at the wider culture, the wider Roman Empire, it looks like totally ridiculous to say that we're gonna... I, see, I don't um, have that impression at all. I mean, reading Paul, I think... No, no, but that's really what I'm saying. But there's no. that just kind of, this kind of, like, it seems like naive, like everything, rejoice in everything, our suffering is, is for Christ. So anyway, I'm wondering what's the place, you've talked about hope and, and optimism. I guess, what's the place for rejoicing, you know, in the midst of, of what, you, what you consider to be this... this I married uh, 52 years and I love my <laughs> wife. Okay. That's, a, that's a cause for rejoicing. I mean, I'm being serious about that. You know, the, you, you don't rejoice over, wow, we won the election. <laughs> Who cares about that really in the long run? You know, but um, I rejoice in the fact that uh, we have a son with Down syndrome. That is a source of enormous joy for us. Uh, and I think you discover those points of joy in ways that, uh, I'm not gonna answer your question adequately. I'm already off on the wrong t track. But I mean, the, the, the rejoicing comes in discovery of love and love is only experienced between people it's not experienced through political statements or you know cultural analysis or any of that other stuff so when you say that you, people are rejoicing it's because they found something you know now uh, is there a certain amount of uh, boosterism in the new testament oh i would think so you know i mean but that's because the guys that were writing it were completely taken with the message and I don't blame him for that. But I see, I read the scriptures. <laughs> I think, I think the guys that wrote, wrote scripture were kinds of pains in the ass. I mean, they really, they really said things that were very forceful. I mean, Paul was a difficult guy to be around. I mean, he, he, I don't know how Timothy made it. I mean, Barnabas <laughs> didn't. Barnabas didn't. John Mark didn't. You know. I mean, they, they and that's the John Mark was the guy who wrote the gospel. You know. I mean, the so. I think, I think what's beautiful about the New Testament is its raw edges, you know? And, um, and, and I, I'd love to meet Paul. I don't think I'd like to work for him, <laughs> you know? So I think that's, that's the best way I can answer that. But could I go back to the, di you, you asked a really interesting question. What makes now qualitatively different? The digital revolution, you know? The technology of uh, soft coercion is greater than any time of history, more sophisticated and more all-pervasive. And that is a qualitative difference. It's a difference in kind, not just in degree. Uh, that's what I would argue. We have a reception waiting for us in the great room, uh, to which everyone here is warmly invited, but I think we have enough time for one more question. I saw Chris's hand a while back, so. Thank you very much for your presentation. I mean, I'm very much trying to disconnect every once in a while and, you know, have some silence. But I, what I really want to do is I want to follow up with that last question. Yeah. Um, so what I'm seeing just in my own life is people are kind of getting tired with Hollywood, tired with celebrities, tired with politics, just a pervasive disenchantment that's happening. Um, and people are forming you know, online communities with similar interests and things like that. So there is some community building, admittedly, even with, you know, the video games, virtual communities. Um, do you think that the powers that be are really in control of the narrative anymore if people are so disenchanted, even with the educational system? Uh, are we, can, can anyone control this narrative or is this digital turn that we've taken and the economic 
inequality that you spoke about, is that, is anyone really in control of that? And, and I guess just as a quick uh, attachment to that question, do you think that, that COVID-19 and lockdown has had any meaningful change in the future of anything, or is it just a blip on the radar uh, of, you know, experience? Because it seems like all of this sort of false sense of security that we've all been operating on just slightly got eroded away, and it was sort of that apocalyptic sort of thing where you kind of see there's a lot going on beneath the surface. So these are just some thoughts. I don't know if they're in our ticket. No, those are. You, you got about three really good questions in yeah. there. Sorry. I, I, no, no, that's 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 great. The the you may have to help me remember them because I'm old. The the uh, but I but I want to uh, think about that for a moment because uh, I I don't think I think the people who are in control think they're in control, which is operatively the important fact. Okay. Now the unfortunate thing about that is, is that they're likely to get really ugly surprises that they didn't, they didn't predict. And a perfect place for that to happen is in the development of AI right now. You know, there's really disturbing tendencies in, in the way that the people who are developing hyper smart artificial intelligence assume that they can control it, when evidently, very evidently, they can't. Okay, so that, I think that answers your first question. In terms of people getting angry, I think, there's a lot of people who are getting angry, but they let the anger burn them out, and then they become indifferent, which means that they're more easily controllable, not less easily controllable. That's a real concern that I've got. I forget what the last point was that you made. In, oh, yeah, COVID was critically important, critically important. Rusty's in the back room right over there, and he was one of the very few voices that said, this is a big problem, and we're being you know, scammed. And a lot of people criticized him for that, but he was absolutely correct. You know, the, the, uh, there was a lot of deceit that went on during the, the COVID thing. A lot of sincere effort at the beginning, those first three, four months. They, I mean, I, I don't fault anybody for the kind of urgency that they brought to it. But three years, you know, I mean, it's a control thing. And it, and it trained a certain class of people, a certain group of people to be um, obedient. And the whole republic was be built on so the sovereignty of the individual, not the herd mentality of, oh, whatever the government tells us to do, you know. So it's a, politically, it's a very dangerous moment in the country, you know. I just want to give kudos to Rusty in the back because he took a lot of heat and he was right on COVID. On that note, uh, please join me in giving a hand to our speaker. Thank you very much. You guys are great. <laughs>